I'm about to make a video about the Halo TV show. Oh my god, dude. I gotta tell you about this. Hello, viewers, across the world and throughout all time and beyond and everything from point A to B. I am Caleb. I am a YouTuber. I love Halo. I've never made a review of a TV show or a movie before, but I've been saying I'm going to review the Halo TV show since it first came out, and I finally have decided to do it. So... <sighs> I love Halo. If you've never seen my videos before and you've never seen me say that I love Halo, or if you didn't notice this $1,500 chair that I'm sitting in currently that's not worth $1,500 in any way, that's why I got it. It's green. It's got UNSC on the back. It's pretty fucking dope. I'm also wearing my chain on it. My chain. My, my baller chain. Uh, I'm a giant idiot though, is what I'm trying to say. I I'm approaching my review from the perspective of someone who holds Halo very dear to their heart. That being said, I will do my best to be as rational as possible and understand the fact that the showrunners do not care about me necessarily. They want to make a show based on a video game that's been very popular. You can't just turn a video game into a movie. <laughs> Of course you can't do that. That wouldn't work. It's just an important fact. I'm aware that the showrunners for the Halo TV show and the Silver Timeline, they didn't exactly look to the games for that much inspiration. For example, they're quoted as saying, We didn't look at the game. We didn't talk about the game. We talked about the characters and the world. So I never felt limited by it being a game. That is a quote from the Halo showrunners that I saw when I was really excited about the Halo show and seeing Pablo Schreiber cast as Master Chief. And I saw that and I was like, oh, that's, that's not, that's not good. Mm hmm yeah, mm hmm It's Friday or Saturday again, depending on when Tara gets the video up because she's really slow and she wakes up at fucking 4 p.m. every single day, 4 p.m. Central Standard Time, that's like, Midnight. We got more flavors dropping, guys. We got cotton candy. We got more love bomb. I'm not sure we have any more Kev's candy left. I think we're done. I think we're done with that one. But we got another flavor coming next Friday. A whole, a whole nother new flavor coming next Friday. And then two Fridays after that, a whole nother new flavor. And then two Fridays after that, a whole nother new flavor. And then a whole new product coming within the next 45 days. So go ahead and go to sour.gg and buy the cotton candy while supplies, supplies last. It's sells out almost instantaneously. And you snooze, you lose. Sign up to the email list. We send an email first. The video goes up the next day or the day after. So the site will be every single Friday restocked. Good luck, good luck. Bunch of stickers, bunch of merch too. If you can't buy bags, we're setting it up guys. We're setting it up. Go to sour.gg, buy the new flavors and profit heavily. Just kidding, we're not. We're breaking, we're breaking even, we're breaking even. We're building something cool though. We have no money. We have no money, yeah. But I still gave it a chance, and I still have watched every single episode the day that it has aired since the very beginning, sitting, face red with rage, blood pressure high, heart like a tomato about to erupt. Here's a quote from me that matches the same energy that the Halo showrunners are giving to people like me. I hope you get glassed. I said that very recently. Here's my thoughts on the show. We're gonna go through a play-by-play -play of every single episode from episode one, season one, to episode eight, season two, which just aired last night. Okay, guys, so I'm fucking fresh on this and I'm gonna be really, I'm gonna scream, I'm gonna yell, I'm gonna be rational, I'm gonna be logical, I'm gonna tell you the parts I liked and I'm gonna tell you the parts that I didn't like that much. By the way, the show is called Halo, so in spite of me trying to be unbiased, I'm going to have some expectations. You know, no matter how understanding I'm going to be of the silver timeline, I understand that a TV show can't be written the exact same way that a fucking game can be written, okay? But also there's books. There's books. There's books. There's Halo books. There's like 35 or 36. Uh, uh, anyways. Episode 1. Contact. The series begins on a dirty Mars-like planet called Madrigal, which is under attack by Covenant forces. They immediately introduce a brand new character that has never seen the Halo world before, a character called Quan Ha. 
an angsty teenager that all of us younglings can relate to because of how angsty she is. Little Quan sees the Covenant, they get attacked, there's an onslaught, uh, Spartan 2s come rescue them. John 117 and Silver Team, which I'm very grateful they didn't <clears throat> ruin. Blue Team, by the way, this is Blue Team. Okay, this is blue team. They're awesome. Silver team, I don't have that many expectations with. So this is fine, okay? Silver team is tasked with repelling the Covenant forces from Magigirl and saving the people. They don't, only, they don't save anybody except for Quan Ha. Kind of a big moment. Magigirl gets attacked. Okay, bada bing, bada boom. Spartan Master Chief 117, epic big Pablo Schreiber guy. He discovers a Forerunner artifact. Okay, that's very Halo. That's pretty cool. It activates in his presence. Bit of a derivation from the original Halo lore. All right, that's fair though. But it, it seems like he's some kind of chosen one, okay? This fucking artifact really likes the Master Chief. Okay, mm -hmm. I also mm -hmm. like him. Mm -hmm. And they're both boys. Immediately, we are blatantly hinted in the first episode with a deep connection between the Master Chief and this Forerunner artifact that's very important that the Covenant want. Then, the Master Chief gets an order to kill the little girl, Quan Ha, the new character that's never existed. And he disobeys that direct order, immediately going fucking AWOL. He decides to protect her, and that sets the stage for John 117's internal conflict and the greatest narrative to any show that's ever come. Master Chief has a mind of his own. Thank you, Halo TV show, for letting me know that immediately. All right. My first big complaint when I was watching the show, by the way, was this moment when Master Chief takes off his helmet to show that he is vulnerable to this little teenager girl so she doesn't, uh, you know, so they can form a trustful bond for some reason. I'm not against the Master Chief taking his helmet off. By the way, I think that, you know, in a TV show, obviously you're paying for Pablo Schreiber. You want, he's a good actor. You want him to be in the show. You want him to be able to be a character that people remember and see, etc., etc. But at the same time, I don't know about taking the helmet off that much. Like this time it's like, okay, that's kind of lame and stupid and weird, but it, it, it makes sense for the show. Like, it's it's passable. Episode 2, Unbound. So John and his new buddy cop story friend embark on a, a, a grand mission that disjoints them from the evil that is the UNSC, and they seek refuge with Soren 066, another Spartan 2 that went AWOL, by the way, from the UNSC, because they are evil, and he left them, and that's what we're learning heavily here. Soren not only went AWOL, he is also now an insurrectionist leader. Leader, AKA an any, that's what we call them, us book readers. The second episode introduces audiences to the rubble, a pretty cool kind of space thing, place. It's like, I don't know, it looks pretty fucking cool. It's a bunch of asteroids interconnected and it's an insurrectionist space. It's, it's, it's cool, it's very Halo, I love it. Episode two also delves a bit into John's past, revealing his childhood relationship with Soren and sets up the narrative of rebellion against the UNSC. They were both Spartans, they were both gathered by the UNSC in a very specific way that, you know, leads them forming a, a brotherhood that supersedes alliance of the UNSC or the insurrectionists or, or whatever. They're brothers, Soren and John. The discovery of the artifact's power from the first episode draws the attention uh, of the UNSC and the Covenant. All that big, large-scale conflict aside, let's focus on personal drama. <laughs> and also politics within the rubble, which in my opinion feels like a departure from the large scale, truly existential struggle that humanity is facing by just being wiped out literally by the covenant. Anyways, that's episode two, really fun. How about episode three, Emergent season one? So episode three, the reason I stopped watching season one, just to be clear, there is a human being who has been raised by the Covenant, a person named McKee, I think. A person, I'm not really sure. But this person leads a raid on a UNSC Corvette to locate the epic Forerunner artifact from the first and second episodes. There are these worm things, which are pretty cool in episode three. It's like these worms. They're from Halo. They make up these creatures called hunters, which are quite literally just super organisms made up of smaller organisms that communicate with one another and create, you know, neurological networks of synapses that are just individual. It's cool. It's really cool. I like this part of episode three a lot. <laughs> In spite of everything else. But yeah, it's just like, okay, human be there's a human being character in the in the covenant okay maybe they're doing that so they don't have to animate as much so they can keep the budget low how much was the budget of this tv show 
10 million dollars per episode in season one you mean like game of thrones you mean this show had the same budget as game of thrones one of the best tv shows to ever exist so maybe i haven't been too harsh maybe there aren't any excuses Oh my god! Meanwhile, on Rubble, the interconnected asteroid fucking Rubble, Rebel fucking city or whatever, Quan tries to rally support for her cause. And in this episode, you've got an epic juxtaposition of Quan's political maneuvers with the Rebel any cause and John's growing connection to the Forerunner artifact. Also in episode three, we get a bit of bonding between the Chief and Cortana, which is kind of cool because that's like a thing that I like in the show and the game that I thought I'd you know maybe would be cool in the in the show and Cortana is just like a a brain clone essentially of Halsey she's an AI a supercomputing AI thing we find out how she's made and it's this woman Halsey who's essentially the Master Chief's mommy she makes a flash clone of herself and then steals the brain it's just we gotta go ball. The UNSC is very bad in this show. They're always experimenting and just they're always the bad guys no matter what it seems like which is really awesome because that's exactly how it is in the games. Just kidding. There's actual nuance and complexity in the games and books. In episode four, Homecoming of the Halo TV show, John, the Master Chief, is driven by visions induced from touching the artifact and molesting it, which leads him to a mission returning to his homeworld, Eridanus II. Here, he searches for a new artifact and explores his forgotten past, guys, and the, the warthog is really lame in this episode, and it's really dumb, and it looks stupid, and this episode's, like, not good. I don't like this episode at all. It's one of my least favorite episodes. We go back to an exploration of John's childhood, which includes him being abducted by Dr. Halsey for the Spartan 2 program. This marks a significant divergence from the canonical lore of the Halo universe. Because I feel like that's probably what a insanely indoctrinated super soldier would be worried about is their own personal trauma. That's what I feel like they'd probably be worried about when there is a... Uh, you know, a force of aliens hell-bent on destroying every single living hu human alive, and they just glass planets. I feel like my personal trauma is probably really important. And so is Quan Ha. You know Quan Ha from Madrigal? Episode 5, The Reckoning, or Reckoning, whatever the fuck. John has yet again another encounter with the artifact, and it results in him having a vision of McKee. That's right, the alien human that leads the Covenant, uh, that led the Covenant aboard the Corvette where they attack them and all that stuff. And like, I, and he was dreaming of her now. He's, he's, it seems like he might be falling in love with her. So he dreams of his new bitch and the show really starts to pivot towards mysticism. And I just don't, it starts to get hard to understand here, not to understand the story. It's, you know, elementary, uh, but why they did this. This episode also explores some of John's consequences for his increased sub insubordination with the UNSC. He's positioned as a rogue element there and he's like kind of a, a bad guy. Then the UNSC loses the artifact uh, and they face heavy casualties. Casualties. There's really cool fight scenes. That's a pretty cool part of this episode. Like, pretty much throughout the whole show, all the fight scenes are, they're good. There's some where it's like, it looks like I did it in, in After Effects, or sorry, Sony Vegas, with some of like the muzzle flashes and things along those lines. But I'll wait for the really nitpicky stuff for the end once again. I, I do like that part though. The, the fighting in all these episodes against the Covenant, it's pretty cool. We do start to realize that the Covenant is a real threat though. Now, they're really a bad, they're bad. They're really bad. Okay, good. I didn't know that. I didn't know they were bad and they've been glassing planets. I didn't know that they were bad. I didn't, I, did the UNSC not know that either or what, what's happening there? Episode six, sucks. This episode basks in the aftermath of the losses, mm, the loss of the artifact and the, oh my God. Additionally, they delve into the origins of the Spartan II program and John starts to realize his own indoctrination and his loss of identity caused by the UNSC, which to me seems extremely insignificant and like doesn't make any sense why this six foot nine guy who's like whole life has been dedicated to killing things and like trying to protect UNSC and, and humanity, why he cares about his indoctrination and loss of identity. I, th I thought I thought he might have known already. I think he that's like kind of the, the job. It's less of them being, you know, lied to. It's more of them just being heavily trained they kind of know like they're stolen from they didn't they're not, they're not their memories aren't wiped his realization leads to a revelation that challenges his loyalty to the unsc and his mommy 
Dr. Halsey. It adds emotional depth, I think, is that's what they're trying to do, I believe, but uh, alienates familiarity in every single way, which, you know, for, at this point, they've alienated every single facet of familiarity us fans of Halo have uh, with this guy beyond just a suit of armor. No more stoicism, no more duty bound man guy, no more super soldier, emo boy, emo boy. Yeah, emo boy with personal trauma, but there's the covenant. It's also in this episode that Kai removes her pellet and then gets really overwhelmed in combat. She gets she gets she gets really overwhelmed because she's like uh, not a super soldier anymore because she's like she can feel things and she's got red hair now, which is cool. I like that part. I liked how they added that in there. That was really meaningful. Episode seven, Inheritance. Quan goes on a quest for answers about her family and her planet's fate. It leads her deep into the desert. Why do we care? Well, I don't, but they seem to think that we do. She seeks guidance from a mystic tribe of awesome people who are old and why are they important? I have no idea once again, but this storyline is rich in mysticism and Predestiny and all sorts of fucking nonsense. And it, you know, kind of takes another uh, large step away from Halo. So you've got this awesome new Quan story, which I do not give a singular fuck about, nor do I understand. In this Quan story with the backdrop of the UNSC's political machinations and the threat of the Covenant, you know, it being an actual existential threat for humanity looming. Take that, combine it with Quan's personal journey and you juxtapose that uh, with her search for identity along with the Master Chief's search for meaning and you got yourself a fucking good show, dude. Just kidding. It's dumb. It's it's fucking, it makes no sense. How are How is anyone, even people who don't know what Halo is, like, I don't, obviously I know what Halo is, so I have a lot of expectations, but I struggle to see how anyone with a functioning brain can be like, oh yeah, this is a good show for $10 million a fucking, uh, an episode on Paramount Plus. If it's on the CW or Spike or FX, I get it. That's a solid fucking TV show for cable TV, you know, but $10 million an episode? Just do it in Blender, all right? It's way better. I don't get it. I don't understand. I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't fucking get it. I don't get it, dude. It's fucking dumb. Anyways, episode eight, Allegiance. My favorite episode. Uh, you got the love triangle. You got the love. They're not, it's not even a triangle. It's love between John and McKee. There's a, an alliance formed between John and McKee at this point. They have a shared connection to the Forerunner artifact. They're both chosen chosen people very awesome very contrived i love it the whole awesome part about halo is that the master chief's just really lucky and it's like wow why is he why is he so lucky it's it's like because it's you it's the player it's like it's what makes it beautiful it's what makes it cool you're you know you're this guy it's unlikely odds it's a, it's a story it's not being a chosen one who, who cares they have visions of the halo do you know the halo from the tv show halo you know that the big ring thing yeah, the UNSC doesn't like McKee. John really likes McKee. He fucks her. He fucks her rotten, and it's amazing. And there's a forbidden relationship. It's it's amazing. It's it, it's intimate, a physical relationship here, guys. Halsey goes off the deep end in this episode, and the ethical boundaries are crossed as they always are. Uh, you know, a new low for mommy, I guess. And then, oh no, crap, McKee, the human raised by the Covenant, betrays the UNSC. There, she has complex loyalties. She reaffirms her allegiance to the Covenant. Episode 9, Transcendence, Season 1, Halo. Best show ever made. Fuck yeah, dude. Sugma. If you don't like it, Sugma. How about that? Sugma. In this final episode, the lines between friend and foe blur. All right, guys? Because we find out the true cause of the war between the Covenant and the pursuit of the Halo rings and the great journey, everything becomes painfully clear. The truth is revealed! The truth is revealed! Captain Keys reveals the truth about the Spartan 2 program to Silver Team. They all cry. There's a moment of clarity. I don't know what happens. I don't really give a fuck. I don't remember, to be honest. Dr. Halsey escapes because she's an evil bitch. She's a deceptive evil woman. I then just found out that they use a uh, flash clone in, in her stead. It dies and it's, uh, dude, she is evil. She really actually is evil. And I feel like that's pretty, pretty loyal to the series. I will say the only character in season one that is loyal to the series, in my opinion, is Dr. Halsey. And it's not completely loyal, but it is somewhat. Then John, everybody goes to High Charity, aka Raz. <laughs> 
they go to recover the 400 keystones. There's some pretty awesome fight scenes. There's an ensuing battle. It's cool. It looks good. There's a condor, which is really cool. Instead of a pelican, I was like, is that a pelican? Why does it have, why can it do slip space shit? And then I was like, oh wait, that's a condor. That's right. I know everything. I'm, uh, awesome. Then McKee decides to activate the keystones to save John, and he's injured, and then Cortana takes takes him over, and she beats the shit out of everybody, and that's awesome. That's a really cool scene. He goes full-on Master Chief mode, books Master Chief mode. It's pretty cool. It's pretty fucking sweet, and yeah, that's about it for season one. I didn't, I didn't, and McKee's like, I don't know, she vaporizes or some shit. I forget, honestly, dude. I just watched it, and it's uh, it's escaped from my mind. I've got notes, but I didn't write down much, to be honest with you. So anyways, what the fuck? Season one, not good. I give it a zero out of 10. Why do I give it a zero out of 10? Because I think that everything about Halo that I've ever read or played, even after Reach, even after Bungie handed the games off to 343, even it's worse than Halo 5. All right, guys, it's worse than Spartan Locke's fucking comedy hour, late night TV show. It's worse. It's worse. It doesn't make sense. Why are they using guns that exist in now times? Why do I have some of the guns that they use 500 years in the future? Why do I have them laying back here? For example, why are they using Kalashnikovs? Why are they using Kalashnikovs? This makes no sense. I don't know if they used this in season one. I can't remember. I blocked it out. But they use these in season two. They quite literally use these in season two, dude. What? Why? At least the Covenant have actual weapons like this. I really am fucked up, guys. I love Halo so much. I got something wrong with me. Season two begins with the aftermath of the raid on High Charity. Roz. <laughs> And then we have a new conflict on this planet called Sanctuary, where John and Silver Team face a very desperate situation against the Covenant. We got interstellar war. We got personal drama still. They introduce a fellow named James Ackerson, who, by the way, I do like as a character. Okay, I do like as a character. Not always. Not the whole... No, I don't like him that much. But, like, he's a little... He's all right. He looks evil, which is cool. Huge plus. He's an antagonist, by the way. He's another antagonist. His whole thing is questioning John's loyalty and his mental state. And then you've got Soren's subplot, which I'm gonna be honest, I thought Soren was Dave Chappelle for a long time. I know he's not now, and I, I, I kinda like Soren. I kinda like Soren. Soren doesn't really exist anywhere else in the Halo lore too much. He's, pr he's pretty cool. He, I kinda like the guy. It seems interesting. He's like kind of cringe, cliche, sci-fi shit. But it's like, hey man, if you made a whole show about this, I wouldn't be mad. If it was like pre-Covenant Invasion, pre-Halo, pre really? There's no Master Chief and it's just Soren. I'll watch it. Soren falls into an incredibly obvious trap and gets arrested for piracy because he's a fucking dweeb. Oh, by the way, Soren has a son. Not sure if I men mentioned that. Kessler is his name. Quan Ha, remember her? She befriends little Kessler and... um. Yeah, it's pretty pretty adorable, honestly. Little Kessler. I do like Kessler. I think he's a cool little character. I think that's that's pretty unique. We go back to Rubble. We got some Quan drama. What happens? I don't know, nor do I care. Let's skip it. Yeah. Soren's wife is really mad at Soren's crew for betraying him. Then she goes on a journey to find him. She's very well equipped. She's just a regular woman. That's going to be awesome and, and very well. Spoiler alert, it doesn't. And she dies one of the most horrible deaths you can possibly imagine. Genuinely. I ain't shitting you. It's fucking bad. Ackerson doesn't trust Silver Team. He doesn't want to send them on any missions. Cobalt Team gets sent on a mission and then they all die and then there's like some for some reason they try to prevent the silver team from finding out about that i, I don't do it i don't know it's dumb as fuck john gets kai and silver team to train harder because he saw the covenant on sanctuary and he's worried about their uh you know their sort of their their fucking strategies changing and whatnot he's trying to prepare riz who's still recovering from the last season's uh, final episode. By the way, we find out that Ackerson's holding Halsey captive in a s fucking, some kind of weird Apple Vision room or something. I'm not even sure. It's pretty cool. Ackerson also is using Cortana at this point to help figure out what the Covenant are going to do next. I already said earlier that Cobalt team went out on a mission and died, but they went out on a mission on Reach, the planet that they're currently on, uh, the Visegrad Relay. And John finds that out and realizes, oh, Oh, the Covenant are on reach. Ackerson knows, and he's like, has a personal vendetta against me. And th this is where it gets really odd. It gets really bizarre. It doesn't make a lot of sense. John gets Silver Team and goes to the Visegrad Relay 
Uh, they try to be inconspicuous because they are not allowed to be fucking deployed or activated or whatever. While this is happening, the Arbiter is with McKee at Sword Base on Reach, and they start killing Marines, and it's a pretty interesting thing. They find the larger Forerunner Keystone that, for some reason, is not guarded that well. I don't really understand that or get that at all, uh, but, you know, Debs Patterson directed this episode, so... Maybe we should ask her why that happened the way that it happened. Silver Team goes to Visegrad Relay. They run into Oni operatives and they get detained. And, you know, John's like, there's Covenant here. There's Covenant here. Jacob Keyes, used to be captain, now an admiral for some reason, decides to formally suspend Silver Team from action and orders that John is to undergo a psychiatric evaluation because he is crazy and not to be trusted because he thinks that there's Covenant on reach. By God, is he so wrong though? John is escapes and then goes and hangs out with the spook that is Perengoski who reveals to him that he, she, sorry, reveals to him that she never left Oni and uh, yeah, there's like people and stuff and then Ackerson shows Jacob Keys that Cobalt Team died and basically reveals also that he's a liar and that uh, Jack, Jacob was wrong to say that he was it's so dumb dude it makes no sense he's enacts the winter contingency he's mad as fuck at oni and he he uh decides to evacuate and defend reach because he realized oh my god there is coming here john was right holy fuck all the while this is happening ackerson is secretly removing essential assets from reach effectively leaving every non-essential human being behind to just die in spite of them knowing that the the covenant is already there and that everyone is going to uh, well, die. Ackerson leaves basically everyone to die, including Halsey, everyone. Ackerson is such a piece of shit. It's fucking insane. You're a fucking dweeb, Ackerson! And also, this is a guy who said he actually played the games, by the way. The actor who plays Ackerson, he claims to have actually enjoyed Halo and played it when he was young, so that's fucking embarrassing. Oh yeah, by the way, the reason Ackerson's doing that is revealed his sister, Julia, was a candidate for the Spartan 2 program and she died during the augmentation progress pro process and that's what he's that's why he's he's killing a lot of people and just being a you know an, an evil an evil villain is because of that because of a personal vendetta meanwhile we go to Quan protecting Soren's wife from the fucking crew and she kills him and stuff it's it's I didn't mind that scene I honestly it was okay it was all right. It was it was the best like Quan thing so far. The Covenant begins to invade Reach. <laughs> Perez's family gets fucking ev eviscerated by plasma bombardment, and then we create another important character. Perez becomes an important character to the story because her family's dead, and now she's loyal to you know. Is she's part of the Silver Timeline now, guys? She can't fucking escape that shit. They then find out McKee is stealing Cortana's AI crystal. Shit really hits the fan. John is fighting elites without his armor with his fists which makes no sense at all by the way just in case you're wondering a even a seven foot super soldier augmented cannot fight a fucking nine foot tall alien with armor on and a plasma sword like it just it's not gonna work out dude it's not gonna work out it's pretty established in the books uh, an, elite, an elite can go toe to toe with a spartan barely with his armor on Barely. It's like they're barely even with close quarters combat. But alas, that doesn't matter. Logic does not apply to this world whatsoever. And it's not real. So who cares anyways? Captain Keys or Admiral Keys or whatever sacrifices himself. And I tell you what, this is one of the greatest travesties of the whole thing because the story of Captain Keys in Halo Combat Evolved and the events of Reach and Fall of Reach, dude, you couldn't have a more misinterpreted character than Keyes. Keyes is one of the greatest characters of all time. In this show, Keyes is a bumbling fucking idiot. He, it makes no sense. There's no reason for him to be there. And he sacrifices himself. What? Anyone else could have done that. You don't need a fucking, the Admiral, who is supposed to lead a group of humans on the ring and eventually get Turn, oh my God, it's what a waste of a character. Silver Team gets ambushed by the Covenant after this, by the way. John is then wounded, but guess who spares his life? That's right, his girlfriend, McKee. And she tells the Arbiter Var not to kill him. Ah, yes, very cool. And then Vanak dies. Boo-hoo, I would like to pretend that I care, but I really don't. Also, this part, my least favorite of all the fight scenes, the muzzle flashes genuinely look like I, I added them on in Sony Vegas Pro. Incredibly embarrassing. Silver Team gets cornered by a brute 
chieftain, which is awesome. Then Quan rescues them and that other, the woman as well. Reach gets glassed. John sneaks a peek of it and then dies or fucking, I don't know, something like that. McKee tries to get Cortana and go rogue with an elite to find the ring herself or themselves. And Cortana doesn't want to do it. Uh, and <laughs> Cortana refuses to help McKee initially, but then decides to help convince Var by showing Var John's memory. Riz is hurt really bad and then finally decides to become a human being and is no longer a super soldier that is dedicated to saving humanity from the covenant. She just wants to be a normal person. <laughs> what the fuck? You're stupid. Then we go back to an okay storyline that I actually sort of like a little bit and I don't, I can't explain exactly why. I think it's just because Soren. Soren and his wife try to find their son who they eventually find out was stolen by the UNSC. So, you know, that's not good. Then they have this just nonsensical cremation thing for Vanak with Quan and John, and it's, man, it's so weird. And John swears he's gonna hunt down everyone who wronged him. And he ignores his mother's request to just focus on, uh, you know, finding the rings because those are more important than personal vendettas, because they are. I'm on Halsey's side. Then we get a little something interesting from the Mystic Nomads that we saw a few episodes ago that spoke to Quan and the 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 Mystic ch Shaman woman back on Sanctuary tells Quan that a monster is coming closer. The monster. Me, I was like, oh, that's probably the flood. Hopefully that's the flood. Kind of chill if it's the flood. I'm excited about the flood. The only reason I'm watching this is to hopefully see how they depict the flood. That is the only reason that I have left to watch this show because otherwise it's ruined my life. Then we go to Onyx, which is a really cool place. And the book Ghosts of Onyx is one of my favorite books of all time. It's a really good book. I fucking love that book. I don't know why I love it so much, but it's cool. Ackerson's on Onyx, Kai meets Ackerson and she begins to lead some Spartan 3s. So now we have Spartan 3s. We're getting a little more Halo, okay? I will admit, up until this point, the only thing holding me on was the idea that the Flood might show up. Now we've got Spartan 3s and Onyx. <laughs> John, Halsey, and the other ensemble of people we're supposed to care about for the sake of this silver timeline thing go to the Oni secret headquarters on Onyx. And John goes there, and then they're, they're captured, and he wants to confront Parangoski. Soren and his wife start looking for the little son in the Oni facility. Quan and Halsey go to a Forerunner cavern. They run into Miranda Keys, okay, and her science team. I'm with the science team! And then we go to the Spartan Threes. We got Perez, the woman that John rescued from Sanctuary. There she is. She's a trainee in the Spartan Three program. Spartan Threes are volunteers, by the way, in case you weren't aware. Big difference between Spartan Twos and the Spartan Threes. Ackerson's like pretending to be a good guy. He's like, well, the Spartan 2s were uh, involuntary. They're evil. They're pieces of shit. And then here's the Spartan 3s, my new program that I'm overseeing. But I also have a personal vendetta against pretty much a lot of people that I shouldn't have a personal vendetta against. And I can't look past my own, um, you know, emotions. Then there's a fucking training simulation and stuff. And I just don't like, I don't care about any of this part. It's pretty dumb. I thought it was real fighting for a little bit, but it's not, it's fake. Kai learns some shit about Reach from Perez and she, uh, it interrogates Ackerson about that. And he tells her some half truths. And then also says that John is working for the covenant, which is just awesome. And then John and Kai beat each other up. Kai wins somehow. Don't understand that. She has her armor on, that's how. <laughs> it makes sense, yeah. She could probably would have killed him, to be honest. John kind of ends this whole beat up scene trying to help Kai reconsider her position with Oni. And yeah, I don't know, dude. And it's fucking, it's hard to pay attention, to be honest. And then we have some McKee content. A priest is mad. This guy in the robe, he's mad. Uh, he detects the Cortana transmission and, and then. He orders Var, the Arbiter, to kill McKee, but then the, it's the schism. The schism, but early, and then they fight and, and, and kill each other, and it's kind of cool, and they uh, protect McKee. It's like, the, the fighting is cool. I like the way that that looks, the elites fighting each other, but like, brother, this, this doesn't make... This doesn't really make a lot of sense right now. I'm I'm for it because it's interesting. It's more interesting than all of the other storylines, having a schism this early on, but it's not like religion based at this point they don't even know what the rings are yet there's no there's no being misled or anything up until this point it's just cringe it's just cortana and 
I don't know. Now on to episode seven, Thermopylae, my second favorite book. Gates of Fire by Stephen Pressfield. It's not my second favorite book, it's good though. John and McKee have sex again. All right, this time in the dream world, the, the spirit world, they have a vision, and then we go back to Halsey, Miranda, and Quan, who are investigating the ruins on Onyx. They find some stuff. This cave is not a natural formation or something. I don't fucking don't know, dude. They, they, they realize that it's built by the Forerunner. It's the same people who built the Halo, and it's kind of cool. There's an ancient laboratory, and they find a foreigner scientist which honestly cool this part feels like a horror movie and i love it. it i like the energy i like the vibe i wish they would have been able to uh uh distill this into more of the show but the penultimate episode of halo the series is actually titillating me a little bit i have to be honest hmm interesting so then everything starts falling apart classic halo style there's like a city to a forerunner city down there and then they uh they grab the little device at the little it's like a sample it's a flood it's got flood in it i saw it from coming from a fucking mile away i tell you what motherfuckers and then kwan realizes that her visions are true her visions are real guys because they've got the the, the forerunner artifact and the the flood and it's all it's all there it's all real it's all makes me super horny then soren finds his son and then loses his son and we're back to the spartan 3 training simulation where Ackerson finds out that the whole purpose of that spartan 3 training simulation is to uh uh fucking cause a nuclear reaction to destroy a solar system and potentially even the ring Okay, and then he tells Kai and John, and then they uh, go uh, there, and it just, I, I, he's got his armor back, John has his armor back, guys, it's awesome, I'm really excited about all this. Kai accompanies the Spartan 3s, and John goes in the Silver Team Condor. They go to the Halo location, uh, which is basically the beginning of Halo Combat Evolved. It's coming, it's come out of split, slip space, they aboard the Pillar of Autumn, Captain Key says, Chief, you mind telling me what you're doing with that Snuggie? Or whatever, I forget it. It's been a while since I played it. <laughs> it's better than this shit, though, for sure. The final episode, episode 8, season 2, it's called Halo. Can you guess why? Because there's a Halo there. It starts off pretty good, I'm gonna be honest. There's, like, happy-go-lucky uh, fucking music from YouTube, like, YouTube audio library sound. That's all I could think of. It's just so upbeat and happy. And this dumbass science lady who's surrounded by this positive sort of vibe uh, accidentally, I guess, released spores from the canister that was recovered from the Forerunner ancient site thing. Then there's a zombie outbreak, okay? And I'm gonna be honest, I, I didn't like it at first when I was watching. I was like, this is kind of lame. This is stupid. They're just turning the people who are being infected with the flood into zombies. This is just glorified zombies right now. This is World War Z. But it's not, though. It makes sense, right? We've really only seen the flood infected by infection forms, kind of. Rarely have we seen a singular spore. So maybe it makes sense that they're just kind of, you know, they're just zomboids or whatever. But I, I do like it. So I, I did like that. So far... Episode 8, my favorite episode of all time, the whole Halo TV show. I actually am enjoying this from the very beginning up until... Uh, I, I just kind of enjoy it. Perengoski gets turned into a fucking flood creature, and so does Halsey, which is awesome. Miranda Keys freezes her mom in stasis, hoping to eventually be able to cure her. We're not going to lose Halsey this, on, this early on, so they're going to find a cure for Halsey of the flood. Now, if you can find a cure for the flood, then... What's the point? What's the point of all this if you can just stop the flood? Isn't that the whole reason the rings are there? Isn't that the reason? Isn't that the reason? And we haven't seen that the flood has been cured from Halsey yet. So maybe maybe Miranda doesn't make a cure herself. Maybe we take her to the, the maybe there's a forerunner cure, something like that on the ring. Maybe. Well, if this is the case, then you guys might as well just control all delete and then shut down forever and do that to yourselves as well because this doesn't make any sense now so that aside i like the zombies i think they're pretty fucking cool soren and kwan have a pretty awesome battle with all these creatures it's very horror based there's some body horror in there i like it dude i actually like this episode so far it's pretty good and they even save old ackerson but uh b not before he saves Soren's wife and Kessler the son so like that part's cool the flood tentacle that happens right is that part that in the in the jail cell I was like oh.